There are a lot of different factors that make someone famous. For example, how many people know their name, or the people they hang out with, or the things that they've done. Yeah, or you could look at things like how many Instagram followers someone has. Like for example, I've got quite a few more followers than Ben does. Okay. I mean, I don't really care about that sort of thing much, but. Right, right. If it's just for an example, then it's good to note that, you know, Pikachu has about 100,000 more followers than Jason does, so. You know, you know. As, we're, as I'm thinking about it, it's not really a good example. People aren't okay. really using Instagram anymore. Oh, you do. I think people use it's Instagram. Kind of passe. I use it. Dan, you use Instagram? Yeah. Yeah, Dan uses it. I use it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you consider yeah, everyone who's yeah, ever yeah, lived, okay. Jesus Christ is arguably the most famous. Jesus is so famous that his name is used as a swear word. We don't use anyone else's name as a swear word. Oh. Benedict Cumberbatch! Taylor Swift! <laughs> oh. Justin Bieber, that's hot! Pikachu! Think about this with me for a minute. Jesus' life literally divides history. Our calendars are based on his life. History is divided into two main eras. Until recently, we used the terms BC and AD. BC stands for before Christ, and AD is Latin for Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. His influence is hard to miss. More songs have been sung to, more paintings have been painted of, and more books have been written about Jesus than anyone else. Time Magazine named him the most significant person in history. I think it'd be snowboarding. I grew up watching Disney Channel and everything, and I want to be on one of those sitcoms where I can make children smile. The next biggest technological invention. Like, I want to be the next Steve Jobs. Singing. I would want to be famous for singing. I would want to be able to meet Beyonce and us be friends. Fashion designer, for sure. But doing backflips, because <laughs> I can't do a backflip. You want to be famous for backflips? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Being able to, like, taste a food and know exactly what's in it, like a food comes to work. I don't want to be famous, <laughs> I really don't. Okay, not money. Ooh, what would, I, what would I want to be famous for? That's a good question. Being the best dancer. Performing, like, on Broadway. Baseball player. Oh, uh, for my dash and good looks. We are on our way to Israel right now. This it's so happening. exciting. I heard they have really good food in Israel. Oh yeah, and it's also the place that Jesus lived. That's the main reason right. why we're going. That's why we're but going. Hey, if we can get some good food, that's pretty exciting too. Awesome. Now you may be wondering, why are we talking so much about Jesus? Well first, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the centerpiece of the Christian faith. And Jesus' resurrection not only suggests that God exists, but that God should be seen and understood through the lens of Jesus. So who is Jesus? And what historical evidence is there for his life, death, and resurrection? When it comes to the question of Jesus' existence, there are no serious historians who would suggest the man Jesus didn't live. There are more mentions of Jesus in ancient literature than Tiberius Caesar, who ruled the Roman Empire at the time. And one first century historian named Josephus, who wasn't a Christian himself, described Jesus as a wise man, a teacher, and a doer of wonderful works. Jesus is also mentioned by other ancient historians like Tacitus and Suetonius. So there is evidence from outside the New Testament that he lived here in Israel. But most of the evidence for the things Jesus said and did comes from eyewitness reports recorded in the New Testament. The New Testament is a collection of books and letters that make up a large part of the Bible. The Bible is divided into the Old Testament, which was written before Jesus' birth, and the New Testament, written after his birth. Four of these books, called the Gospels, were written specifically about Jesus' life from eyewitness accounts. Now, of course, the New Testament was written a long time ago, so it's good for us to ask, how do we know that what we have now hasn't been changed over the years? And we can find an answer to that question through a science called textual criticism. Here's Peter and Jazzy to explain how it works. Okay, so textual criticism works by comparing ancient manuscripts to discover the original wording. Basically, the more copies of a manuscript there are, and the closer they are to the date of the original manuscript, the more confident we can be. For example, Herodotus and Thucydides were ancient historians who wrote in the 5th century BC, 
Now the earliest copies we have of their writings are from around 980, so there's more than a 1300 year gap, and we only have 8 copies of their writings. Yet no classical scholar would doubt that these writings have come down to us in a form that's true to their original copies. And this is the case with many other ancient works as well. For example, Livy's Roman History, 900 year gap, with 20 copies. Caesar's Gallic War, 950 year gap, with 9 to 10 copies. And Tacitus, a thousand year gap, with just 20 copies. And then we come to the New Testament, and what we see here is that the time gap is significantly shorter. It was written between 40 to 100 AD, and the earliest manuscript was written as early as 130 AD. And there are 5,309 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin, and 9,300 others, making the New Testament totally unique amongst other ancient books. Textual critic F.J. Hort said this, in the variety and fullness of the evidence on which it rests, the text of the New Testament stands absolutely and unapproachably alone amongst ancient prose writings. So, we can look confidently to what's written in the New Testament. What we know from inside and outside the New Testament is that Jesus was a Jewish man, born here in Israel in the first century. He lived in many ways like most of us. He ate, slept, laughed, and cried, and he would have walked along roads not far from here. Many people today would say, okay, he lived, and maybe he was a great religious teacher, but no more than that. But there's evidence that suggests that Jesus was more than just a great religious teacher. The first piece of evidence we'll look at is what he said about himself. Okay, so what did Jesus say about himself? Because when other religious leaders might say, here's what's true, Jesus says, I am the truth. And when others might say, here's how you find full life. Jesus says, I am the life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, as if to say, I'm the one who can fulfill that spiritual hunger in your heart. All of us carry around things like guilt or worry, fear and anxiety. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, if you receive me, you receive God. If you welcome me, you welcome God. And if you've seen me, you've seen God. At the heart of Christianity is a message of forgiveness. On many occasions, Jesus said to people, your sins are forgiven. And this statement would have made the religious leaders of his day furious because they knew that only God can forgive sins. So for Jesus to say something like that was to put himself in the same place as God. One of the most direct claims Jesus made is recorded in John's Gospel. He said, I and the Father are one. When the religious leaders heard him say this, they were so angry they wanted to stone him. But before they could, Jesus said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good works, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Those who were around him, who heard him and opposed him, said, you're claiming to be God. Makes me think of what Bono said when he was asked about Hold Jesus. Up, I don't think that everyone's heard of Bono. Bono? Yeah, he's the lead singer of you too. People yeah. have heard of him. I'm just meaning younger people, like maybe older guys, like you and Timmy over here. But younger people, like Dan, have you heard of Bono? Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah see? That's the guy that Ben always talks about, right? There it is. He doesn't know. Bono was asked in an interview about his faith in Jesus. The reporter said, Christ has his rank among the world's great thinkers or good religious teachers, but son of God, isn't that a little far-fetched? Bono replied, I don't think you're let off easily by saying he was a great thinker or philosopher because actually he went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the son of God. So he either, in my view, was the son of God or he was nuts. And I find it hard to accept that all the millions and millions of lives, half the earth for nearly 2,000 years, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I don't believe it. This has been around for a while. I, I don't know too much about Christianity, but I can say it probably because of like um, his words, like how uh, his teachings. I think it's the whole martyr for a cause type of thing. I mean, I think that that level of sacrifice people resonate with. I think generations of telling stories and ritual because somebody wrote a book about him. I never really thought of him that way. I never really thought of him as someone famous. Is he famous? I don't know. He's pretty famous. Okay. He kind of represents the ideal prophet that is captured in so many different religions and creeds across the world. He's the guy that um, 
has forgiven all of our sins. Like, he died on the cross for all of us, right? Because he's the only one that overcame death. That's because he healed a lot of people. Sandals. Sandals. It's that great sandals. What I do think is to do with like aggressive propagation of like Christianity. It's a character that lots of people just have confide in, don't they? So I think that's probably why he's quite quite big. Hey, what's up guys? We're back on the move on a rocky bus and we are just pulling into Nazareth. It's changed a lot, but this is the place that Jesus grew up, so it's pretty cool. We should get some food. Oh yeah, well, we're, and we're definitely gonna get some food. Guys, we're gonna get food. It's been a long bus ride. Here's the update. We found a spot to eat food and to film our next shot. So we got the crew behind me there. Perfect. And uh, some food behind me. Ben, waffle. Ben's I happy. Waffle. It's gonna be great. I think when you look at everything Jesus said about himself, it's clear that he did make that claim that he was a person whose identity was God. Yeah, and that's a massive claim, and it needs to be tested. So let's look at what evidence there is to back it up. One of the first things you'll notice when reading about Jesus is that he lived a miraculous life. He turned water into wine at a wedding. He multiplied food to feed thousands, and he healed those who were sick. We're on the move with the crew today. It's gonna be a good day, looking Bro. forward to it. Have to see a galley. The Sea of Galilee right here. Is it bigger or smaller than I thought? I don't know. Thousands of people gathered on this mountain to hear Jesus give one of his most famous teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. In this message, he said, do to others as you'd have them do to you. Love your neighbor as yourself and love your enemies. Jesus' teaching has been the foundation for entire cultures and civilizations in the West. Many of the laws we have today were originally based on things he taught. After 2,000 years, it still hasn't been improved on. One of my favorite moments in Jesus' life is recorded in the New Testament by Jesus' friend Matthew. A man who suffered from leprosy ran up to Jesus asking to be healed. Now leprosy is a brutal disease. It destroys nerve endings and often led to disfigurement and the loss of limbs. People with leprosy were often treated as outcasts because others were afraid to go near them. This man was so desperate that he knelt on the ground begging Jesus to heal him. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man, which is something no one else would do. And instantly the leprosy was gone. This is such a great picture of the character of Jesus. Not only was Jesus able to miraculously heal the man, he was willing to touch someone that no one else would. Jesus spent time with social outcasts and he didn't let popular opinion control how he acted or treated others. He was friends with the marginalized and those that some might think God couldn't possibly love. Time Magazine named him the most persistent symbol of purity, selflessness, and love in the history of Western humanity. Okay, so while our primary source of information about Jesus is in the New Testament, we also see references to Jesus in the Old Testament. And that's the next piece of evidence we're gonna take a look at. Jesus' fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, specific things about Jesus' life predicted in advance. There's been no one else in history that has ever had a whole collection of books written about them before they were born. Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies, things like where he would grow up or the family he would be born into. And at one point, he fulfilled 29 of them in a single day. Now, after hearing something like that, you might be thinking to yourself, well, maybe Jesus was just a con man who set out to deliberately deceive people. He could have just read about all these prophecies and then set out to do what they said he should do. But there are actually two problems with this theory. The first problem is the sheer number of prophecies he fulfilled. And the second problem is the fact that, humanly speaking, he actually had no control over many of these things. In fact, there were prophecies about the exact way he would die, the place of his burial, and even about the place of his birth. As news spread about Jesus, his message of forgiveness, his love for the outcast, and the powerful miracles he performed, people came from all over to see him. But the religious and political leaders of his day were threatened by his growing popularity, so they plotted to have him arrested and killed. They handed him over to the Roman officials and put him on trial as a rebel against Rome. The Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, interrogated him and said he couldn't find any fault with him. But there was so much pressure from the crowd that he gave in and he handed Jesus over to be executed by crucifixion. They put nails in his hands and in his feet, and they hung him on a cross to die with criminals on his right and his left. 
He was pronounced dead by Roman executioners. His body was taken down from the cross and put in a tomb in a well-known location just outside of Jerusalem. But what we see in the New Testament is the story of Jesus' life doesn't end there. I think people think of Jesus as the long-haired guy <laughs> in the movies. With sandals in a row. With a beard who's having a hard time. Most people think Jesus is white. I don't know if that's true. I think people think that Jesus is just the guy on the cross. Growing up, I heard that Jesus is a really forgiving person, like he's a friend. A wise person that, you know, kind of wandered and taught and everything. Some people think he's the son of God. Some people think that he's the savior. God's son is kind of like the connection between God and people. I see him more as a historical figure. A good dude and he was a prophet. Big, powerful guy in the sky. I don't know. I mean, he's got a lot of rules. <laughs> they think he's a good, he's, they think he's a prophet. They think he's a good man. He's done a lot of good deeds, but a lot of people don't recognize him that he is also God. People kind of think like Jesus is the same, same as God. They kind of put him in the same level as God. I don't know. The final piece of evidence we're going to look at is Jesus' conquest of death. The physical resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone of Christianity. And this matters to every single one of us because we're all going to die. When you go to a funeral and you see the coffin being lowered into the ground, it looks absolutely final. And it is. Unless Jesus died, was buried in a tomb, and then was raised to life. In which case, the grave has lost its power and death has been conquered. So I grew up in a family, there was no faith, no religion, no God, no prayer, no Bible. It was just, didn't talk about it. My dad uh, was so atheistic that when my older brother was born uh, a few years before me, uh, his name is Matthew, and he said, we have to spell his name with one T as not to be biblical. I don't want it to be spelt like it's in the Bible. And so, my, so literally on his birth certificate, his name is spelled with one T. And then when I was 17, I was in high school, and uh, I met a guy named Chris in woodworking class, and he, he came up to me and he's like, listen, this guy was, you know, womanizer, drug dealer, you know, whatever, the whole thing. And that's why I hung out with him. And, uh, and he said, you know, listen, I got my life changed by Jesus. And I'm like, well, what's, what's this about? And so um, I began kind of exploring as a skeptic, which is what I was. So when, when Chris started talking to me about Christianity, as someone who grew up in an atheistic home, I wasn't just going to accept what he was going to say. So I was like, okay, did this actually happen historically? What's the evidence? Because I'm not, I'm not a super emotional person. I'm not, I'm not gonna just buy into something because I get swept up in the emotion of it. So then what that made me do is I gotta go investigate this stuff. So when I was 19 was the first time I actually walked into a church and I found skeptics there, skeptics who were actually serious about answering the deep questions. It was all these people going, yeah, I have that question too, but here's what I found, this legit thing and let's compare this and this. And this. I started to open up the old Bible that my grandfather had given me. Because Christianity functioned around this person and not just ideas and philosophies, I had to figure out, did this guy even exist to begin with? I explored, I studied, I looked at it. So I saw in the Gospels he obviously existed, but then began realizing there's people outside of the Bible who have no Christian agenda who were all claiming he existed. And it was in that exploration that I actually came to realize that Christianity is not emotional. It's not true because I want it to be true. It's true because the actual tomb is empty. It was based on a historical event. And that's what I realized was different about it. So I began to realize that this is either the most important thing in the universe or it is the dumbest thing. It can't be half interesting. So after I had studied, looked at the evidence, I came to the conclusion that this wasn't just hopeful thinking, wishful thinking, that it was actually true. There are four pieces of evidence for Jesus' resurrection. First, his tomb was empty. When Jesus' close friends went to visit his tomb on the third day, his body wasn't there. People have come up with all kinds of explanations for this, but none of them stand up against thoughtful evaluation. For example, maybe the authorities stole the body. 
But if they did, then they would have shown that they had it when people start saying that Jesus had risen from the dead. Or others might say, okay, then robbers stole the body. When the disciples heard that Jesus had been seen, they ran to the tomb. Jesus' body wasn't there, but the grave clothes that he'd been wrapped in were still there. These would have been the only valuable things that the robbers might have taken. Even the piece that had been around Jesus' head had been folded up and put off to the side. The second piece of evidence for Jesus' resurrection is his presence with the disciples. Jesus was seen more than 11 times after his resurrection, and on one occasion by a group of around 500 people. Now some might say, well, that could have been a hallucination. But think about it, 500 people can't hallucinate the same thing. The third piece of evidence is the transformation we see in the disciples. Here's a group of people who were devastated that their leader had been killed, and they were afraid themselves that they would be arrested and killed. And then suddenly, they were transformed. Instead of being discouraged and fearful, they were full of hope and courage. And they were so confident in the message, they went around telling everyone, Jesus is alive. And many of the disciples were later killed or tortured because they wouldn't stop spreading this message. Why would someone be prepared to die for something they knew wasn't true? But the disciples believed it was true. It had transformed their life. And this extraordinary movement has spread all over the world. And that's the fourth piece of evidence. Jesus is still impacting lives today. There are now more than 2.4 billion Christians around the world, representing every ethnic, economic, and social background. The disciples spoke about a risen Jesus, and there are billions of Christians around the world today who also speak of an encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. So how do we respond to all this? It seems clear that Jesus really did claim to be a man whose identity was God. And when we look at the evidence, his teaching, his life, his character, his fulfillment of prophecy, and his resurrection from the dead, it all provides strong support that what Jesus said about himself was true. And this truth isn't just head knowledge, it's truth we can experience in our hearts. I've experienced a relationship with Jesus and it's changed my life. And that's what Jesus wants for each one of us, life and life in all its fullness. God has revealed himself in Jesus. Jesus really is who he claimed to be. He really did rise from the dead. And that means there's hope beyond this life. And there's hope for this life. And that's what I've found, and you can too. Taylor Swift! Pikachu! Yeah, oh, it's burning, Pikachu. it's burning, it's burning. Oh, I did it again. I didn't mean to that time. Mother Teresa, man! Ding! Khloe Kardashian! Samuel L. Jackson! Buzz Lightyear! Oh! Did you just... Sorry. Too far? Pikachu!